Open your Bibles here tonight to the book of Titus, and we'll be looking at verse 10 and following here, finishing out the chapter. In the book of Titus, <clears throat> this is one of the prison epistles, not, yes, pastoral epistles rather, pastoral epistles, First and Second Timothy and Titus, written to young men in the faith and young men wanting to serve God and be a minister of the gospel. And uh, last week we looked at Titus and uh, the qualifications for elders and bishop. And if you want to sum up the book of Titus, verse 5 in chapter 1, for this cause I left thee in Crete that thou shouldst set in order. And these things setting in order was what the Apostle Paul wanted Titus to do. And um, things that are wanting and ordain elders in every city as I have appointed thee. When verse 10 says, There's many unruly and vain talkers and deceivers, especially they of the circumcision, whose mouth must be stopped, who subvert whole houses, teaching things which they ought not for filthy lucre's sake. One of themselves, even a prophet of their own, said the Cretans are always liars, evil beasts, slow bellies. This witness is true. Therefore, rebuke them sharply. They may be sound in the faith, not giving heed to Jewish fables and commandments of men that turn from the truth. Unto the pure, all things are pure. Unto them that are defiled and unbelieving is nothing pure. Even their minds and conscience is defiled. They profess that they know God, but in works they deny Him, being abominable, disobedient, and unto every good work reprobate. Let's pray here tonight. Dear Lord, thank you for the scripture we have before us and the words to encourage a young preacher, Titus, in the gospel ministry. And Father, as we look at what Paul wrote to Titus to strengthen him and, and guide his life as a young servant of God, I pray as we consider these before us tonight, you speak to our hearts. Guide me, Lord. Help me to honor your Son's holy name, Jesus Christ, and to honor your Word, the living Word of God. So bless us as the saints of God gather here tonight around your Word. Feed us with your heavenly manna. We'll give you thanks. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. The American Indians, they had a, a method of... Um, they lived off the buffalo, the American Indians out in the Midwest, and they used the buffalo for everything from their tents to their food, and uh, it was every part of their diet. They, they followed the buffalo. So, but they had a technique for killing buffaloes, and what they would do, <clears throat> one Indian would put the skin of a, a buffalo over him, and they would, they would have a certain cliff area, and they would dig a hole that he could fit down in, and then he would put this on and go out toward the herd, and some other men would, would shout and make noises and start the herd in a stampede. And he would start running. And the other buffalo would follow right behind him with his buffalo. And he'd jump down in the hole and they would run right over the edge of the cliff and, and perish. That's how they killed their buffalo like that. Now, that is a real picture of what a deceiving person will do. Now, tonight, we're, we're looking at, for there are many unruly and vain talkers, deceivers. And that American Indian with a buffalo skin over him running and deceiving the buffalo to their own demise. And that's what a deceiver does. They take what is good and they turn it to their own advantage and they deceive people. Um, for Titus here, uh, Paul's wanting him to set in order the things that are needful. And part of the gospel ministry is, is people that are vain talkers. Now, just before that, look at verse 9. Holding fast the, the faithful what? Faithful word that he's been taught that by what? Sound doctrine, both to exhort and to convince the gainsayers or those that, uh, who, are in, who are contradict. Uh, that's an old English word for contradictory. Um, holding fast the faithful word, God would have us. That's what uh, Titus is to do here. But the problem you run into, every time... God is moving in a certain direction. I remember J. Vernon McGee saying this. He was on a radio program preaching the Word of God and people were responding. And J. Vernon McGee said the Lord was blessing the radio program in this certain area. And he come to find out on the radio station right after this, there was a cult that had the time right after that. And he was like, oh, all of his listeners had tuned into him. As soon as he went off the air, guess what? They heard this guy preaching false doctrine. And it just it grinded J. Vernon McGee because he didn't want them people hearing this false doctrine. But he knew that the people that enjoyed listening to him just leave. How many of you just leave the radio on from one station, you know, one person to the next? It just rolls on. And he was so disturbed about this because he said, God was moving, but isn't that the way Satan works? The minute God's moving something, Satan has the false teachers right there to deceive people. 
And um, for there are many. Now, OK, look at how Paul describes this. Now, there's talkers. You ever met somebody that was a talker? <laughs> I've met people that are just a talker. And uh, I knew I remember one night I was after church and this gentleman that I went to church with. He was a talker. He stood in the park a lot. And I finally realized the only way I'm getting away from this guy, I just got to like cut in and say, I got to go. <laughs> you know, he was just talking, talking, talking. And I was like inside, I was like, I got to go. But I didn't want to be rude. But he was just that's his makeup. He just like if he had a captive audience, he took advantage of it. But these people, what kind of talkers? They were vain talkers. Now, give me a definition of vanity or vain. What does that mean, a vain talker? I would say it's idle talker. Okay, idle. Okay. I'm not saying really of anything. You ever heard of the, the, the little full of hot air? Okay. They say a whole lot of everything, but not enough of anything. It doesn't mean anything. Vain. But not only are they vain talkers, they're unruly. You can't rule them. They don't put themselves under authority. And that's one mark of a false teacher. They have no authority structure over them. They don't want to have somebody ruling. They're unruly. You can't guide them. You can't speak to them now. Was the Apostle Paul sent by God? Was he sent by God? He was sent by God, called by God, ordained by God to give the truth of the gospel in such a way that people can get saved and God used him to write much of the New Testament here. And that's where that sound doctrine comes in. Somebody that's unruly, uh, that does not put themselves under the authority of Scripture and godly men. Now, I remember Dr. Fall was saying it like this. If it's true, it's not new. And if it's new, it's not true when it comes to doctrine. Does that make sense? Does that make sense? Because how long has the Scripture been around? How long has the New Testament been around? Yeah, 2000. That's a long time. And if somebody comes up with something that nobody else has seen before in 2000 years, you can guarantee it's probably not what? True. Because sound doctrine has been around for a lot of years. And uh, for there are many unruly people that don't put themselves under any authority. They want to be on their own. And, and especially the authority of the word of God. They're vain talkers and deceivers. Especially they of the circumcision. Now, what does it mean of the circumcision? Well, um, turn to Acts 15 here just for a minute, and you'll have part of the answer for the circumcision. Acts 15:1. What does it say? <clears throat> is here in Acts 51. And certain men which came down from Judea taught the brethren. Okay, this is what they taught. Except you be circumcised. After the manner of Moses, you cannot be what? Say, is that true doctrine or false doctrine? That's false doctrine. That's false doctrine. And that's what Paul is referring to here to Titus. They are the circumcision. They were thinking you had to keep the law of Moses in order to be saved. That's not New Testament teaching. That's not Bible teaching. That's not the Spirit of God teaching. That's not... The doctrine of the disciples. Well, turn back over to the beginning of the book of Acts here. Um, Acts chapter 2 and uh, verse 42. Well, let's back up to verse 41, Acts 2, 41. And they that gladly received his word, they got saved, were baptized. First step of obedience. The same day there were added unto them about 3,000 souls, and they continued, what's that next word? Steadfastly in the apostles, what? Doctrine, the teaching of the apostles. Now, how can you spot somebody that is a vain talker and a deceiver, somebody who's a false teacher? They don't follow New Testament teaching. They don't follow doctrines of the apostles. They create their own doctrines. Now, um, tell me what's wrong with this. I just opened my Bible and... Uh, <clears throat> I hit the scripture verse. I just put my finger on it. It says, um, when Jesus told Judas, uh, what thou doest, do quickly. Okay, I just put my finger on it. Then I just opened my Bible in another place, and it says, and Judas went out and hung himself. Is that from what I should do? Do you see what I'm saying? You see how people can just take one verse here and one verse here and put it together, and 
That's called false teaching because you've got to compare Scripture with Scripture. You've got to compare what you get out of Scripture with what other people have taught that have been spirit-filled men. Because sometimes if you get something out of Scripture that nobody else is getting out of Scripture, I would be very careful with your interpretation because you're not the most spiritual person in the whole world that's ever lived. And if you've got something nobody else has got, I'd like, eh, you better be careful here. For there are many unruly and vain talkers, deceivers, especially they of the circumcisions, whose mouth must be stopped. Now, what's the danger of a false teacher? Okay, if people listened to them in Acts 15, 1, what was the danger for them? They all go over the cliff. They all go over the cliff. Right, they go over the cliff because they were saying, unless you be circumcised, you can't be saved. That's false doctrine. And people can end up not knowing the Lord or not being saved or living a half-fulfilled life because their theology is all messed up, whose mouth, now Paul's encouraging Titus, and he's very strong with Titus, whose mouths must be stopped, who subvert whole houses. Now, why houses? Where did the New Testament church meet for the first couple hundred years? Just met in homes. There was no general assembly building like this. It was all house to house. Um, who subvert whole households, teaching things which they ought not. Now, what was their motivation at the end of verse 11? Why do these false teachers teach? For filthy lucre's sake. What's another way to say that? Filthy lucre's sake. For dishonest what? Money. money. For dishonest gain, for money. Their motivation was money. Not for truth, not for the welfare of the people, but what can I get out of these people to fill my pockets? For filthy lucre's sake. Yes. Um, godliness with contentment is great gain. Not money. Now how bad was it on the Isle of Crete? That's where, that's where Titus was. One of their own selves, even a prophet of their own says, the Cretans are always what? Liars. What does a false prophet do? They... False teacher. They lie. He had, did Satan have plenty of recruits there he could work on that island with? He had plenty of recruits all around because they're all liars. Now, the Christians were always liars, evil. Now, Paul just doesn't say they were beasts. He calls them evil beasts. And not only does he call them gluttonous, he calls them lazy gluttons, slow bellies. What a tough field. But that's where Titus found himself because these people needed the Lord. They needed to get saved. And Paul, bear witness, he, he'd been on this island. Now, one thing is interesting here about Titus and Paul being on the island of Crete. You won't find that in the book of Acts. It's not in the book of Acts. And the thing about the book of Acts, it's not everything of everything. There are things that Paul did that, that the Holy Spirit didn't record for us. And this is one of the times that when Paul said this witness is true, he was there. But it's not recorded in Acts that Paul was there. This witness is true. Now, what do you deal with false teachers? Look at verse 13. This witness is true. Therefore, rebuke them what? How do you deal with false people? Sharply, sharply. Does that sound like that might sting a little bit? Does that sound like a, a strong rebuke? Because that's the only way some people hear it. And they might take offense. Now, I've had situations where somebody in the church, their manner of conduct wasn't befitting of a Christian, and I approach them, and guess what they do after their approach? Sometimes they blow out of the church. Well, should I have handled it lovingly? Certainly, speak the truth in love. But sometimes when you rebuke somebody sharply, they don't receive it well because they don't want to hear it. They want to continue in whatever they were doing. But for those that do humble themselves, hear what was said, even though it may have stung them and hurt them, rebuke them sharply, they may be sound in the faith. The difference is the heart that's received it because... There are some people, the only time, time they hear it is sometimes you have to be really strong with them. Rebuke them sharply. Now, when a shepherd 
had, like they got their sheep and there's one sheep always wandering away, what would the shepherd do? If the one sheep was always wandering away, what would he do? Well, bring them back. But sometimes he'd do something to them that's a little strong and just bring them back. You ever, you ever heard the story? The shepherd would break their leg. And he would carry that lamb with a broken leg around his neck till it healed. And never again would he ever have that lamb wander away. And sometimes that rebuking sharply, it hurts. But if you have a lamb that's always wandering away, you know it's going to get in danger sooner or later. And sometimes a shepherd would actually break the leg of a wandering sheep, carry it around his neck and love till it heals. And after that, he never would have a problem again. Wherefore, rebuke them sharply that they may be sound in the faith. And that's the goal. It's not to make somebody look bad. It's not to make you look good and them look bad. But it's that they may be sound in the faith. And that goes back to true doctrine. That goes back to putting yourself under authority. Now, not giving heed to Jewish fables. The Jews had the written law. They also had the oral law. What was the oral law called? The what? The Torah. Yes, the Torah. Now, you remember the encounter Jesus had that his disciples didn't wash their hands? Remember that encounter they had in Scripture? Did you know they had a, in the Torah, the oral tradition, a way that they had to wash their hands? You had to wash your hands and somebody had to pour the water over your hands when you're washing it. This is all written down in the Torah. The water had to run down your arm and drip off your elbow a certain way and, and, and washing this or you didn't do it the right way. Does that add any, if you washed your hands that way, does that make you more spiritual if you washed your hands that way that the water would drip off your arm and drip down? Does that make you more spiritual? No, it doesn't add anything to, it doesn't take anything away, it doesn't add anything to you. That's what means not giving heed to Jewish fables because they're thinking, oh, we do it this way, this makes me so much more spiritual, I'm following the way that our traditions of men not giving heed to Jewish fables and the commandments of men that turn from the truth. Now, if Satan can't corrupt the truth in the sense of denying it totally, sometimes he can muddle it up so it's not pure and clean and easy to understand. So much comes into conscience because people that are deceivers, that are unruly, they're vain talkers, if they're deceiving people over and over again, what happens to their conscience after a while? Somebody that's a deceiver over and over again, what happens to their conscience? It becomes what? Seared, hardened, unresponsive to God's word. And that's what you see in verse 15. Unto the pure, all things are pure. Now, as we look at that verse, a godly person that's a righteous person, that's spirit-filled, that's yielded to God, the things they encounter in their life, they don't put a little taint on it or they don't take it and make it unpure. Unto the pure, all things are pure, but unto them that are defiled, those that have a hardened heart, a conscience not sensitive to God, they're defiled, unbelieving, is nothing pure. They can take the most truth of God that's so simple and before you know it, they've turned it in such a way that it ends up being something totally different than what God meant it to be. Even their minds and conscience is defiled. And the sad part about it is, look at verse 16. They profess that they know God, but in works they what? Deny him. That's where people end up. If you don't have sound doctrine, you, you profess you know God, but in works. So how does Jesus say, how do you know a true prophet? What's your fruit like? I can't see the root, but I can see what? The fruit. I can't see your heart, but I can see what's on the outside. Roots are buried. Heart is inside. You can't see a person's heart, but you can be a fruit inspector, and you can know those that are the true men and women of God that know God, how they live. Because, they fest, but in works they deny him. Well, if they are always after filthy lucre's sake, that's a real tip-off right there, isn't it? Now, yeah. I'm not naming any names, but have you ever heard people on television asking for money over and over again to furnish whatever in their lives? And, and sometimes it gets to be overwhelming. And, um, 
Yeah, you can usually spot those kind of people. They profess they know God, but in works they deny him. Being abominable, disobedient unto every good work. Now, reprobate. We as God's people are called to good works. That's how we're to live. Um, so Titus, he's a young man, set in order. Verse 5, things that are in Crete, uh, to raise up leadership. Paul gives him the instructions there in verses 6 and following, down to verse 9. But these false teachers, they're everywhere. So do we have to be careful who we listen to? Because what does a false teacher do? They mix, mix truth with what? Error. And it just gets all muddled on the other end. Be careful who you listen to because it can infect your mind and your spirit. Make sure people are true to the word of God. So... If you're listening to somebody, how do you know if they're telling the truth in Scripture? How do you know that? You have to know what? Scripture. You have to know it. If people that inspect counterfeit money, you know how they learn how to find counterfeit money? They study the real thing. That's how they find the counterfeit. They study the real deal, and if anything doesn't match up to that, that's a counterfeit. They don't study every counterfeit that comes along, dollar bill. They study the real thing, and then that is the standard between everything else is monitor with. And so as long as you know the real deal, you'll be protecting yourself from false teachers who want to use you for their own ends, who want to use you financially and relationally just to promote themselves. Um, people who are talkers want to have the attention of people. Uh, they want to captivate you with their how articulate they are. But it doesn't mean they're speaking God's truth. Anybody have any thoughts about this passage here? Have you ever ran into some false teachers that you dealt with? You ever had any Jehovah's Witness knock at your door? How about Mormons? I've had them. I've had Jehovah's Witnesses. Are they true teachers or false teachers? They're false teachers. Catholic Church. Okay, Catholic Church, yeah. A lot of false doctrine there. Mariology. We don't worship Mary, do we, as God's people? It's not in the scriptures. It's not part of the Godhead. It's Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Do we see Satan deceiving people all over the place? He is. By false doctrine, false teaching. All right, well, let's pray here tonight. Dear Lord, thank you for what we looked at. And Father, I pray that we'd be able to be strong in our faith and know the real scriptures, that we would never be deceived ourselves. But Lord, help us be articulate that when we spot false teaching, that we may be able, by sound doctrine, refute that God and to be able to move the Christian faith forward, not only in our own lives, but in those that we come in contact with. So Lord, help us to be strong here tonight as your people in good doctrine and good teaching and be able to spot those that promote uh, false doctrine and things that are not founded in the Christian faith and life. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.